Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this morning. We thank you because you brought us together so that your love and your power and your spirit will flow through every one of us. Lord, we're asking you that today you reveal yourself more to every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, Lord, that the spirit of your own son, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ will be upon every one of us in Jesus name Amen. and the vision the revelation of the almighty God be very clear very plain in every one of our hearts in Jesus name Amen. that will lead us in the way we ought to go in the path of righteousness and we'll walk in that path and we we'll live that life to glorify and to honor you here on earth thank you because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray Amen. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 5 And we're reading from verse 6 Matthew chapter 5 We're looking at verse 6 Blessed are they Which do hunger and thirst At righteousness For they shall be filled Here we're going through the series That Jesus Christ gave to the multitude what he gave to the people what he gave to his own disciples i've already showed you and the word of god that jesus christ as he saw the multitude something registered in him that these were the people that needed the power of god in their lives the revelation of the lord in their soul and that power and revelation coming together walking in them and drawing them much much nearer unto the lord we'll come back to verse one and see the multitudes he went up into a mountain and when he was set his disciples came unto him when he saw the multitude will that be the only time he saw the multitude and will that be the only expression and the only response to a scene the multitude matthew chapter 9 verse 36 but when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion did you hear that he saw and what he saw moved him what he saw stirred him up what he saw actually led him to do what he came to do in this world he was moved with compassion every time you see as the lord wants you to see every time you behold as the lord wants you to behold every time you gaze on something as the lord wants you to gaze on that thing then it registers in your heart there is a reason why this is there why these people are there and you are moved with something moved now when it says you are moved it depends on who you are it's not just the multitude it's you inside you there are people that see and they are moved to anger there are people that see and they are moved to jealousy there are people that see and they are moved to indignation there are people that uh, see something and they are moved to something else but because of what was in christ when he saw the multitude he looked on them i told you before when you're preaching you're preaching you're not preaching to the ground neither are you preaching to the ceiling you're preaching to the people in front of you or anywhere they are and you look at them you wonder sometimes why i have to move this way and look at the people move that way and look at the people move this way and look at the people and move that way and look at the people i need to see the people i'm talking to and when i see them and something registers in me there is a need that ought to be made and there is a call we ought to respond to that's why we look at them therefore when you preach the word and you stand before a great multitude then you see them something registers in you and then you are we're told here in verse 36 but when he saw the multitude he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted 
the large strength, energy, something to sustain them and to live the way they ought to live. And it says, they were scattered abroad, a sheep having no shepherd. Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, we're looking at verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people. And he seen the much people. Again, he was moved with compassion toward them. Because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. A sheep without a shepherd. And because of that, he began teaching them many things. That's why he has to come to Matthew chapter 5. You realize and see the multitudes. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, ready, ready to deliver the message of God and the mind of God and the revelation from heaven unto them. When he was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and he taught them. He opened his mouth and taught them. What does it take to teach? Takes knowledge. Yes, I know. What does it take to teach with authority? Teach with power. It takes some um, building up of respect between you and those disciples. Have you ever noticed that those who are leaders in the land, even political leaders, if before they became political leaders, they have been socializing with the people, going out with them, drinking pan wine with them, drinking whatever with them, and in the night class they've been dancing together. Once they become leaders, they put a distance between them because they need to earn respect if they're going to be able to lead effectively. And you see Jesus Christ, yes, he was much, much holier than they were. And he was more righteous than they were. And he was more exalted than they were internally. Everybody knew that. But he had to make that visible. So that he'll be qualified to teach them. If you're a teacher, if you're a leader, you cannot keep on socializing with the people. Staying with the people. Laughing with the people. Gossiping with the people. Acting as one of them. You put a distance, a distance in your character, a distance in your comportment, a distance in your lifestyle. It is that that qualifies you now to stand up above them and declare the word of God, the word of truth unto them. What did he teach them? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed a day that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And now we come to the message of this morning. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at righteousness, for they shall be filled. Thirst and hunger utter righteousness then it says when they thirst like that when they hunger like that then they shall be filled it tells us in isaiah chapter 26 isaiah chapter 26 reading from verse 9 with my soul have i desired thee in the night Yea, with my spirit within me, will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are upon the earth, and in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. When thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the earth will learn righteousness. It says, with my very soul, have I desired you. And with my spirit, 
in the night have I sought after you and then now he says because I've been seeing the hands of your judgment and I know that this is initial the final judgment will still come I know this is earthly the eternal judgment will still come I know this is temporary the final judgment and the permanent judgment will still come therefore when you when the people of this world when they see your hand in judgment and then he says the people begin to say hey if i'm going to make it on that day and escape the judgment of god what do i need i need righteousness then the inhabitants of this world will seek after righteousness now jesus said we can be filled with righteousness he says when you desire when you thirst when you are passionate when you're looking for when you are longing after this righteousness it says we shall be filled i don't need to ask the question is it possible to be full of righteousness jesus said so jesus said so he said you can be filled saturated within and without internally and externally with righteousness it tells the word of god tells us in philippians chapter one Philippians chapter 1 I'm reading from verse 9 and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more Philippians 1 verse 9 in knowledge and in all judgment that ye may approve things that are excellent that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being, listen to this, verse 11, being, listen to it, very important, being filled for the fruits of righteousness. You see that possibility there. Yes, it's possible. We can be full of righteousness. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. It is possible then to be full, to be filled with righteousness. What does it take? How can a man, how can a woman, how can a child of God, how can somebody who has been poor in spirit, contrite in spirit, humble, lowly, repentant, penitent, how can somebody who already has mourned for his own sin. How can somebody who by the grace of God had been touched by the hand of the Almighty God and the Lord has made him now meek, lowly, gentle, submissive, unresisting, a person that is calm and now composed. How can he now on top of that be filled with righteousness? by thirst and hunger and if you are thirsty for righteousness in your life the lord will fill you the lord will satisfy you and the lord will saturate you and think about it think about it what do we really need what do we need to be filled oh somebody says i want to be filled with joy great can you be filled with joy and not get to heaven yes I want to be filled with knowledge can you be filled with knowledge and not get to heaven very very easy yes i want to be filled with wisdom remember solomon can you be filled with wisdom as i say and never get to heaven yes i want my hands to be full of activity ah can you be full of activity and not get to heaven very much that's possible but if there is anything you need to be filled with it is this righteousness that we're talking about if you want to get to heaven if you want to see the lord if you want to make heaven your eternal home your final place of abode on that final day there is this one thing that you need to be filled with and that is righteousness and the only way to be filled, saturated, full of righteousness is to thirst and to hunger. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst. 
utter righteousness, for they shall be filled. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, great passion. The great passion of the thirsty. The great passion of the thirsty. Number two, God's promise to the thirsty. God's promise to the thirsty. Number three, gracious provision for the thirsty. Gracious provision for the thirsty. Come to number one. The great passion, the great passion of the thirsty. Matthew chapter 5, again verse 6. Blessed, happy, hopeful, fortunate, and favored are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. What a great joy! And what a great fulfillment in such a life. They shall be filled, filled with what they are passionately seeking for. Now when you think of hunger and thirst, hunger is an indicative desire. What do I mean? Hunger is something in your life that indicates that you are alive. Hunger. When you are hungry, it shows you are still alive. And although you may have some other problems, but at least you are hungry. And it shows you are not dead yet. Once you are dead, now we don't need a doctor to say that, well, the man is clinically dead. Or the man is really dead. Or the man is completely dead. Now once you don't have hunger, you might open your eyes and be looking at things. There are some things, vital things that are dead inside you. And once those things are dead, it's just a matter of minutes, a matter of hours, a matter of time, and you're going to be off, you're going to be gone. It's an indicative desire, hunger, and thirst. When you're thirsty, when you're thirsty, it's an indicative, it's an indicative desire. Now can I ask you, are you thirsty of righteousness? I know you come to church. I know you attend retreat. I know you have attended the Congress. That's why you are here. That's why I'm talking to you. You are part of my crowd. But do you have a passion, a longing, a desire, a thirst, a hunger for righteousness? Because that is what indicates that you are alive. Not that you are even filled yet. You are not even full yet. You are not saturated yet. By that, with that righteousness. But you have a passion, you have a desire, you have a longing, you have an hunger, and you have a thirst. And you say, oh Lord, I am thirsty. That indicates you are born again. It indicates you are alive. Internally, you are alive. And let's look at Psalm 42. Psalm 42, I'm reading from verse 1. As a heart pants. After the water brooks, so panted my soul after thee, O God. As a heart panted after the water brooks, so panted my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsted for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? It says, My soul is longing after God, passionately seeking after God. My soul thirsted for God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? Now, can you see some verbs there? As the heart panteth after the water brooks. As the heart panteth after the water brooks. Look up here for a minute. Why is that word panteth after? Why is it so important? See, see here. Here is the, it's talking about an animal. That heart, that's an animal. And then it's staying here. And a lot of things surrounding that animal. All of a sudden, the animal begins to feel the pangs of thirst to drink water. What's going to happen? It's going to leave all those things around him there and run after and run after the water brooks. And while he's very, very thirsty, he might see a rabbit around, he'll not run after that. He might even want it, but says, no, cannot be now. 
because there is something I need now. There is something I want now. And as the heart panted, after the water brook so panted my heart, my soul, my mind, after you, oh God, what an indication that you are alive. What an indication that you are really a child of God. You are born again and the life of Christ dwells in you. That everything around you, you abandon them. Because you are so thirsty that the clothes and the job and the marriage and the children and the visa to America and all these other things, they are not important now. The only thing that is important now, you are passionate. You are longing after righteousness as the heart panted after the water broke. So my heart, my soul panted after thee. Oh God, my soul thirsted for God. There is a yearning within me. There is a longing within me. There is a passion within me. There is a, there is a desire within me. It says, my soul thirsted for God, for the living God. When shall I come? Come. When shall I come? That's a verb. When you are thirsty, it moves you into action. You will go to the place of prayer. You will go to the place where you need to seek the Lord and find that righteousness coming from the Lord. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 63. In Psalm 63, we're looking at him from verse 1. O God, thou art my God. That man is alive. It's alive. Oh God, thou art my God. After you have repented, you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you can say, He is my Savior, and God is my Father. And now you can say, Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee, my soul. You see that? It's an internal thing. My soul tested for thee. My flesh longed for, uh, for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. It says, I'm longing. I am desirous. I want him to fill me, satisfy me, and saturate me. Then it says in verse, in verse 8, my soul followeth hard after thee. Do you see that? Do you see the longing we're talking about? Do you see the passion we're talking about? Do you see the desire we're talking about? When you are a child of God, you are passionately desiring the nature of God. And that is holiness. My soul is following hard after you. You know, if you're still like that heart, that is like that animal, and then you are staying here, and you just stay there, and you are not near the water brooks. And there's nothing that moves you to stand up and to run after and to go to the water brooks. It means you're satisfied without that, that river of life. The river, the water that sustains life. That's what I mean for that art. And then for us Christians, it means you are not passionate yet for the water of life that leads unto life eternal. But when you begin to hunger, when you begin to thirst, all the things around you, the clothes, the friends, the people, the opportunities, the privileges, the ministry, even the possibility of preaching. You say, not now, not now. There's something my soul is longing after. Because will preaching take me to heaven? Will ministry take me to heaven? Will officiating take me to heaven? I'm passionately seeking after something. And it's so much in my heart. I have to leave all these things around me here. And run after my soul. Follow his heart after thee, O God. It says in verse 8, my soul. Follow his heart after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. Psalm 84. In Psalm 84, we're reading from verse 2. Psalm 84, reading from verse 2. My soul longeth, yea, even fainted for the cause of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cries out, cries out for the living God. You see, that's the indication that we're alive. When your heart is passionately seeking 
the things of God and you want it more above beyond every other thing on earth now I want you to let, let's use our imagination for a few moments here you are here now uh, leave the heart now leave the animal now let's talk about you you are you know a greater person a more precious person than that heart and we're talking about your soul and you're seeking after the righteousness of the lord here you are now let's say you are here and suddenly thirst grips you you just get thirsty you feel it in the very depths of your being your throat is dry your mouth is dry and then you begin to it's like i must get water to drink now all of a sudden all your thoughts are centered on getting water to drink there may be noise around you there may be smiling friends around you there may be cooperating people around you there may be somebody that wants to bring something to you what you've been expecting for a long time but all your thoughts all your imagination they are centered on just one thing now water and all of a sudden you begin to think you begin to use your imagination where can i get water and which is the shortest road for me to get to the place i'll get the water do i go through there ah, before i get there i don't know whether i can manage to. i'm so thirsty i'm so thirsty and i can't do any other thing now it's water there on the other side you look at the shortest possible distance you are going to cover so you can have that water it's like that with righteousness when you become so thirsty and so hungry after this righteousness and you are passionately seeking after this righteousness no other thing will be important to you it will be righteousness righteousness if they're trying to say some other things invite you some to some other things you put your hands in your ears righteousness righteousness i'm seeking after righteousness ask me why are many people not righteous today they're not thirsty they're not hungry they're not passionate there are a lot of other things that have occupied their attention and therefore even when the water of life is there and the lord wants to fill us with righteousness the absence of hunger and thirst keeps them away from that saturation with righteousness psalm 143 in psalm 143 reading from verse 4 psalm 143 verse 4 therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me my heart within me is desolate i remember the days of old i meditate on all thy words i muse cogitate meditate think ponder on the work of thy hands i stretch forth my hands unto thee my soul thirsteth after thee my soul thirsteth after thee as a dusty land now we're talking about thirst how does thirst actually come how does somebody maintain thirst and uh, let's say for example you are not thirsty if i just begin to tell you you know water is very nice and when you drink pure water cold water i make all the i talk about one hour for about one hour talking about water talking about water and there you are you're satisfied the way you are and you are not thirsty my preaching alone does not make you to thirst my description of water alone does not make you thirsty a person can talk all his heart out a person can give all the knowledge he has about righteousness if there is nothing internal inside you you'll not be thirsty you'll just be there i don't make somebody thirsty when you give somebody some granules for example and that granules have been kind of fried with some salt and then he takes the granules and there's so much salt there all of a sudden he feels thirsty why do people that sell pure water in all these sachets 
Why did they stay near the people that are selling donuts, selling grand nuts, selling peanuts, selling those things? No, they just stay there. And they allow the people selling grand nuts and donuts and pecachin nuts and all those things. They allow them to go in front. And then while they're giving them, uh, you know, the grand nuts and everything, the fellow standing there having pure water, he knows that they are going to call him. He doesn't need to run. Because you see, when they eat all those seeds and they chew all those seeds, all of a sudden they get thirsty. They say, Hey, come here. Why are you stay here? I need water now. There's something that makes you thirsty. And if you're thirsty already, then it becomes simple for us who are preaching righteousness and holiness. You'll say, I abandon every other thing. I want this righteousness. I'm panting. I'm longing. I'm passionate. I'm thirsty after righteousness. Now, these thirst we're talking about how do you describe it number one it's an individual desire individual desire when you're thirsty it's a personal issue it's an individual issue we're all children of god here and we have all come together we don't get thirsty at the same time we don't get thirsty at the same time and it's an individual matter and when you are thirsty after righteousness is a matter pertaining to you in particular and if the other fellow is not praying don't worry it's not thirsty it's personal this is an individual matter if the other fellow is roaming around if the other fellow is involved in other sin that shouldn't bother you you are not drinking water at the same time you are not passionate for the same thing at the same time. Number one, it's an individual desire. Number two, it's an internal desire. An internal desire is inside you. And it's you that will know, I am thirsty. We don't have to announce it. And we don't need to go to people. We don't need to ask them, are you thirsty? Why are you asking them? Does their thirst affect your thirst? You are thirsty. That's the bottom line. You want it. That's the bottom line. Do you want to drink water now? No, I don't want to drink water now. Okay, I will sit down there. Then you are not thirsty yourself. If you are thirsty, it's a personal sin, internal sin. It's an individual sin. Number two, it is an internal sin. Number three, it's an intense desire. Thirst. Thirst. It's an intense desire. Once a person becomes thirsty, it's intense. And if you don't drink water, that time it becomes more intensified. Thirst is an intense desire. Here we are together. As we look at ourselves, as we look at our church, as we look at the people you and I are ministering to, can we sincerely say, can we honestly say that every member of our church intensely passionately internally fully with all their heart are they so passionate at a righteousness what's the answer what's the answer no as we look at this church can we say with all honesty that the majority of the workers in an intense manner in an internal way in a passionate compelling way can we say that the majority of the workers are passionate internally after righteousness the answer is no because the emphasis in many of the other churches and they surround us and we know them and we interact with them the emphasis is healing prosperity getting a job getting married having children if possible getting lottery visa going to america if that's not possible travel to italy or germany if that's not visible travel to europe if that's not possible get into business that's a passion and yet if we're going to prepare the people to get to heaven this must be the one singular thing the one important thing that we get not just the workers we get the members to have an intense 
intensified desire for righteousness number one it's individual number two it is internal number three it is intense number four increasing desire until that thirst is satisfied when you become thirsty there is the increase of that thirst if you're thirsty now and then there's no water to drink the thirst will not say well it's not thirsty it's not responding to me i'm leaving the thirst will increase an increasing desire can you say that in your own heart in your own life even as you have come to this congress that your desire your passion your longing for righteousness has been increasing with all the messages we hear with all the references of the bible we read can you honestly say that passion for righteousness longing for righteousness and desire to be as righteous as the grace of god can make you are you saying that desire has been increasing number five it's an incomparable desire incomparable desire what do we mean by that let's say for example you desire to have something whatever it is on earth and you run and run and run and run and you don't get it eventually you give up you say well uh, maybe that's not my way maybe god doesn't want me to go that direction but thirst for water is not like that if you thirst and thirst and thirst for water and you have not got the water you cannot give up you cannot say well maybe god doesn't want me to have that because i have tried my best and i won't kill myself just running after something i cannot get it for all the other desires we have on us once the desire is not satisfied we quit you give up you say well that's all right that's, i've done my best in the case of thirst it's not like that it's an incomparable desire can you say that in your life that you're so passionate and you're seeking after this righteousness and even though you have not got it you see items areas of your life where you are saying i'm not happy with myself this area is not right that's the area is not right that area is not right and then you don't quit you keep on desiring incomparable desire number six interminable desire interminable desire what i mean by that is this cannot terminate this desire you need to drink water on the first of this month and now this first day don't you desire to drink water again yes you do yes you do you cannot terminate that desire that panting that quest for wanting to have water you cannot terminate it you are righteous or you are born again and even after you are born again that desire still continues and how righteous you became when you were sanctified and then after you were sanctified you thought thank god by grace the second work of grace is done i am sanctified didn't that desire continue and then you are filled with the holy ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues and then the power of the holy ghost came into your life and the things you could do now in ministry didn't the desire for righteousness continue an interminable desire number seven an instructive desire instructive desire your desire your passion instructs other people instruct influences other people it's an influential desire an instructive desire a kind of desire that compels other people what do i mean by that you cannot make other people thirsty but there are people that are thirsty and they're not responding to their own thirst and they still say i can manage without it you know that that's true of water there are times you are still thirsty in a moderate way at a low level and say no i have other things doing now when i have chance i'll go and drink the water and then there's somebody sitting beside you and then it's getting up where are you going i i must go and take water now i am very very thirsty i'm thirsty too and i'm not getting up no problem that's you i, I must drink water and he goes and then somebody else by the other side is getting up. ah what's the matter with you people where are you going to i i need to go and drink water now i must have what i'm so thirsty now 
I'm thirsty too. That's all right with you. You can sit down there. And then you see another person, your friend, and says, It's good. Come, come. Where are you going? I, I need to go and drink. I must drink water now. I must abandon every other thing and drink water now. Then you say, What's wrong with me? Look at all these people. They are responding to their thirst. I am not responding. Is something dead in me? I am, am I so passive? Am I so dead? Is something wrong that I, I am not responding the right way, the proper way? It influences you. Say, well, I think I need to do something about it because others are doing something about it. It's an instructive desire. Do you punch? Do you thirst? Do you seek after righteousness like this? Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Point number two, God's promise to the thirsty. God's promise to the thirsty. Actually, the promises of God are so many. If we are thirsty, uh, do, you, do you sometimes, uh, you have a mind to give somebody something? Look up here for a moment. I like to talk. I don't like to talk to the back of your head. You know, sometimes when you are writing, so you bend down so much when you are writing. That the only place I see, I say, that place does not have communication ability. And I'm just talking to your head. And then I, I don't, I'm not sure whether you are concentrating or not. That's why I say, can you look up here so I can see you face to face? That means that when I'm communicating with you, when I see you face to face, then I'm able to talk to you. That's why I say, look up here and let me talk to you for a moment. Now, praise the Lord. God's promise for the thirsty. You know, you want to give somebody something. And as you want to give him, then he comes. And that thing is in your pocket. Valuable thing. And you are discussing with him. You are trying to size him up. You are trying to gauge the level of his desire. And you are trying to locate him. You are trying to identify him. And you talk this way and talk this way. And the way he's talking, it appears he's not interested in what you have. And so you say, thank you very much. And you divert the conversation. And he feels you have had a nice time. He doesn't know he has missed anything at all. Do you know there are people that don't know they have missed anything at all in the presence of God? God sizes you up. He locates you. He identifies you where you are. And when he sees that you don't have any thirst, he keeps what he has. He does not play with the precious things of the kingdom. And he does not joke with the precious things of the kingdom. He keeps them. He will not give them to you. He wants to locate you to find out how thirsty you are before he can give it to you. Isaiah chapter 44. I mean in verse 3. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 3 For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty I will pour water upon him that is thirsty He wants us to manifest that thirst To show that thirst To declare that thirst to manifest that thirst before he pours the water upon us i will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground i will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring the lord wants to know how thirsty you are before he gives you what he has for you and his righteousness as an experience is not just distributed to every dick and harry not just giving to everybody whether they're thirsty or not but you must show that thirst manifest that thirst reveal that thirst demonstrate that thirst and then with that passion and longing the lord will know how passionate how desirous that you are and then he will pour that water upon you and fill you with righteousness it tells us in uh, isaiah chapter 41 isaiah chapter 41 verse 17 when the poor and the needy seek water and there is none and their tongue faileth for thirst and their tongue faileth for thirst 
the Lord is not just going to give you that righteousness just because he wants everybody righteous he wants to see how serious you are about it how desirous you are about it how passionate you are about it and how thirsty you are to have the righteousness that's why it says when the needy and the poor they want to seek water and there is none and their tongue faileth for thirst i the lord will hear them i the god of israel will not forsake them verse 18 i will open rivers in high places i will open open rivers in high places in high places what does that mean there are low places it is there uh, will open rivers in the low places there are valleys he didn't say this verse is not mentioning opening rivers in the valleys in the high places could he be talking of the highly placed people yes will he be talking of the people that have become more elevated than ordinary members of the church now you are right ministers 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 in high places those who occupy high places in the kingdom in the church in the ministry i will open rivers and as we're here for the congress what a high place to be to be in and then the lord says if those ministers are thirsty in the high places i will open rivers in the high places and mount and fountains now in the midst of the valleys thank god it's not only for the people that are ministers for the members in the valleys as well do you see the completeness of scripture that the only thing that satisfies a child of god and a servant of god will be this righteousness that we're talking about to be filled with righteousness whether you are in the high place or you are in the valley i will open rivers for them in the high places for the ministers if you're a minister and you are not thirsty for righteousness something is deadly wrong with you if you're a minister in the high place and you exalt preaching and ministry officiating above having the infilling of righteousness something is really wrong with you we shall all come around you and lay hands on you and pray that thing out of you you must be thirsty after righteousness and then it's when you're thirsty like that he says i will open rivers in the high places and then he also says fountains fountains of water in the midst of the valleys i will make the wilderness a pool of water and dry land springs of water he wants us to be thirsty and then he can pour the blessing upon us that's the condition the promises are great but then we must be thirsty i come to isaiah chapter 55 isaiah chapter 55 verse 1 oh everyone that thirsteth come ye to the waters everyone that thirsteth come ye to the waters you must come why wouldn't the lord bring it to you where you are why do you have to come the lord will bring it to you where you are what else do you want him to do he sent his only begotten son to this earth what else will he do he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross what else will he do he forsook his only begotten son to bear your sin your sin in the singular your sins in the plural what else will he do and jesus rose from the dead for a justification what else do you want god to do and then he gave instruction to the apostles to go into all the world and preach the salvation and sanctification this righteousness and holiness unto all men what else will he do and he made he preserved the bible the word of god now you have a copy in your hand what else will he do he has described to you the way to get to heaven what else will you do and he has given you ministers and preachers today to declare unto you the way unto life eternal that the only way is to have peace with all men and to have this holiness without which no man shall see the lord what else will he do and then he has told you that you server will come that's all that you have to do now and then you're still sitting back there and you're saying if he knows that that righteousness is so important to give me why doesn't he come to me and give me why do i have to come 
Are you serious about what you are saying? You must come. It says, Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that has no money, come ye buy and eat. Ye come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfies not? Hacking diligently unto me and eat. And eat ye that which is good. And your soul to delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of David. Will thirst and the Lord will satisfy us. Psalm 37. Psalm 37 verses 3 and 4. Psalm 37 verses 3 and 4 Trust in the Lord And do good So shall thou dwell in the land Verily thou shalt be fed Delight thyself also in the Lord Delight thyself Delight thyself also in the Lord And then he tells us And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. If that desire, personal desire, individual desire, that desire, that internal desire, that desire, that intense desire, that increasing desire, that incomparable desire, that interminable desire, that instructive desire, if you really passionately seek after the Lord and you are desirous of this righteousness, he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Psalm 21, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 21, verses 1 and 2. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation. How greatly shall, how greatly shall he rejoice. Thou hast given him his heart's desire. Thou hast given him his heart's desire. If we don't have the righteousness, it's, um, it tells the story. It's a revelation that we actually do not have the desire. If we have the desire, it says, he will give you the desires of your heart. And that's why we need to passionately seek after God until he brings that righteousness upon us. Psalm 145, Psalm 145. In Psalm 145, reading from verse 16, Thou openest thine hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. The desire of every living thing. Do you notice the word living thing there? Because dead things don't have desire. And if you don't have desire for righteousness, you are dead. Uh, but if you are still alive, alive in Christ, alive in the Lord, alive to spiritual things, there will be a desire. And it says, this almighty God, this is what he does. He actually satisfies the desire of every living sin. Reading verse 17, now the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is near unto all them that call upon him. To all that call upon him, in truth, he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and shall save them. We know that when God promises, he fulfills. If we fulfill the condition, we're told in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. The desire must be there. And then with that desire, we're drawn near 
with the heart, a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. He is faithful that promised. If we have not experienced then this promised fullness with righteousness, that means that we have not done the part we ought to do. We have not thirsted, we have not desired, we have not sought, we have not longed after the way we ought to long after it. So what we need to do now is to truly thirst and truly desire and truly seek the Lord and truly pray with all our hearts and then believe the Lord. The promise of God will be fulfilled in our lives. I thought you'll say amen. amen. I come to point number three. Gracious provision for the thirsty. Gracious provision for the thirsty. Underline that word, gracious. is the provision of grace. The provision of grace. The righteousness we are talking about is not the product of human endeavor. Human trial. Human struggle. Human word, self righteousness. No, not at all. This is gracious provision for the thirsty. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you pick up your concordance and you search for the word seek, you'll see a lot of things that the word of God, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, tells us to seek after. And then you compare what you are seeking after. What you are running after, what you are fasting for, why you are praying, what dominates your conversation, what dominates your desire. Make a comparison of the things we know in the Bible. The Lord is saying, Seek righteousness, seek meekness, seek the kingdom of God, seek his righteousness, seek love. You look at the things that the Lord has told you to seek. And then you look at what you are seeking and make a comparison. You might find a wide margin between what you seek and what the Lord has called you to seek. And the many churches that influence us around us, either they're going for a day of fasting once a week or once a month, or they're going for vigil, night vigil. Or they're going to a prayer fasting camp. Or whatever they're going for. All their billboards and posters that we see. What they are telling the people to seek for. Make a list, itemize all those things. The many churches and the many fellowships are telling the public to seek after. Make a comparison of what they are telling them to seek after. Go back to your concordance. Go back to your Bible. And look at the item of things that the Almighty God is telling us to seek after. Make a comparison. The churches are far, far away from the mind of the Lord. What he wants us to see. There's a wide margin. And these are the churches and the fellowships and the assemblies that influence us. Now, look at your own programs in deeper life, in your local government, and in your region, and in your state, and in your various nations. Look at all those posters and look at the emphasis on the posters. Because those posters is an invitation to the people to come and seek after something. Compare 
all those things that the posters are telling us to seek after and compare that with what you find in your concordance in the bible what the lord is telling us to seek after there's a wide margin why don't we come to the bible and say if we're going to seek after anything here is what the lord has told us to seek after look at the praying of the prayer warriors and look at the emphasis on their praying and look at the people that moderate here whether it is congress or workers retreat or it is sunday worship in a sunday worship sometimes we tell the person moderating get there and pray and lead the people in prayer for a few minutes before we start and listen to the request and listen to what he's saying and listen to the people you are here today people you want to worship god what are you looking for are you looking for children are you looking for wife are you looking for prosperity are you looking for this this is our chance our father in the lord is here there is a great combined service today what are you seeking after today there we are make a comparison between what these prayer warriors and what these moderators are telling the church to seek after and compare that with what the bible tells us seek after this there's a wide margin if the church is going to please the lord if the church is going to be at the center of the revealed will of god will abandon all those things all those temporary things maybe they are good things but they are not eternally good and they won't lead you to heaven well then we come back to the bible and say praise the lord this is what the lord has told us to seek after and here are the words of the lord jesus christ himself in matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and then he said you don't even have to seek out all these other things all these other things shall be added unto you this is what we are to seek psalm 48 in psalm 48 i'm reading from verse 9 psalm 48 verse 9 we have thought of thy loving kindness O god in the midst of thy temple according to thy name O god so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth thy right hand is full of righteousness you're seeking the lord his right hand is full of righteousness and that is what he calls you to stop yourself and to get up and seek the lord for righteousness he tells us in verse uh, in um, psalm 118 1 1 8 psalm 118 reading from verse 19 118 reading from verse 19 open unto me the gates of righteousness you see the passion of the psalmist you see the desire of the psalmist you see the longing in the heart of the psalmist you see what the people of old what they were seeking after in fact there's a way you can know the trench of the church if you were to be able to collect together all the handbills and the posters of even let's take deeper life alone because you might not be able to get all the posters and the handbills of the other churches uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago uh, because uh, you know once uh, the season is over they remove those uh, handbills or whatever and then paste others but at least we can check up in our own prayers and look at the posters of 1980 1976 1978 jesus 78 and then 1982 and come to 1985 and then come to 1990 and come to 2006 we can line all the posters and all the handbills from the beginning and then just read and study and read and study and see the emphasis on those posters as the years go by and then you will know whether the church in its emphasis in its desire in its passion in its prayer whether we're still maintaining the original desire or not but what the psalmist was praying for in that verse 19 he said lord 
open to me the gates of righteousness i will go into them and i will praise the lord what are you going to praise the lord for if you have not entered through the gate of righteousness if there's no righteousness within you and you don't even have the desire you are not passionate about it you're not seeking after it. there's another thing occupying your mind occupying your thoughts and it's all no self it's all self glorification self gratification what are you praising the lord about but when when the gates of righteousness are open and then you enter in through the gates of righteousness it says in verse 20 this gate of the lord into which the righteous shall enter i will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation isaiah chapter 45 in isaiah chapter 45 I'm reading from verse 8. Isaiah 45, verse 8. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. And you see the kind of righteousness the prophet is praying for. Let the skies pour down righteousness. It's not like a drop of righteousness a trickle of righteousness it's not like just a little righteousness let it be dilute let it be a flood let it be like rain pouring down from heaven and when your passion when your desire for righteousness is that intense when your passion is that complete or comprehensive and you are saying lord the righteousness i want i want you to pour it down from the skies let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together i the lord have created it verse 24 of that same isaiah 45 surely shall one say in the lord abide righteousness and strength surely the people will say in the lord do i have righteousness and strength even to him shall men come and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed isaiah chapter 46 verse 12 and verse 13 hearken unto me ye stout hearted Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted. What do you understand by that? Was stout-hearted, strong-minded, strong-willed, hard-hearted. Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted. What do you want to say to those stout-hearted that are far from righteousness? Stout-hearted. There's something in a hard heart, a stout heart, a hard heart, hardened heart, a rebellious heart, a self-conceited person. There's something in the people that concentrate on themselves that make them to move far, further and further and further away from righteousness. It's not in their thoughts. It's not in their imagination. It's not in their desire. And that's not the thing they are panting after. They, they're too much involved in self-glorification. That they do not pant after. They do not run after. They do not desire righteousness. Hacking for this once. Hacking unto me. Ye stout-hearted that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. God is saying, I bring it near. Are you so dead? Are you so passive that you do not even want it as near as it comes? He says, I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off and my salvation shall not tarry. And I will place my salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. This morning, the Lord will do it. Amen. Give me a good amen. amen. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 1. Hearken to me. Ye that follow after righteousness. Thank God there are people following after righteousness. And I am one of them. I said I am one of them. That's why I preach it. That's why I love it. That's why I emphasize it. And it's an individual thing, personal thing. Because I make my choice. And you have to make your choice. 
first passion is individual and you have to make up your mind as an individual it says hearken to me ye that follow after righteousness ye that seek the lord look unto the rock whence ye are hewn and the hole of the pit whence ye are deep verse 5 my righteousness is near my salvation is gone forth my arm shall judge the people the owl shall wait upon me and on mine arm shall they trust lift up your eyes to, to the heaven and look upon the earth beneath for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner but my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished it's available today and if we will seek the lord the lord will fill us with righteousness Hosea chapter 10 <coughs> Hosea chapter 10 reading from verse 12 Hosea chapter 10 i'm reading to you from verse 12 we need to seek him until we find him so to yourselves in righteousness reap in mercy break up your fallow ground if your heart has been hard if the signs of decay and death have been very visible on your life the lord is saying you have a part to play you have something to do break up your fallow ground have mercy on yourself have compassion on yourself don't despise this one single thing that will help you to get to heaven don't do it for any reason and seek the face of the lord break up your fallow ground then he tells us for it is time to seek the lord till he come and rain and rain not just drop it it's not a trickle not just a drop to rain righteousness upon you look up here you find somebody your friend just sitting by your side he trained yesterday and when he was with you you know you know how he was then he went out to do something and then the rain came upon him right there and when the rain came upon him you know all over him the rain just poured down poured down poured down him but he needed to come in here and he couldn't avoid coming in and he came by your side and the moment you saw him like this you say you know he's trying to say i was in the rain then you say, you need to tell me i can see it on you we don't need to tell the people i have righteousness when he raised righteousness upon you we'll see it on your face we'll see it in your language We'll see it on your dressing. We'll see it in your attitude. We'll see it in your comportment. We'll see it in your disposition. We'll see it in your interaction. You don't need to tell us. You don't need to make a noise about it. Get into the rain and come and let him rain righteousness upon you. And when the rain of righteousness is upon you, you will not even have to tell an enemy. The enemy will know this man, this lady has got a rain of righteousness. The rain is falling. How many people want to get into this rain of righteousness? You rise up and you talk to the Lord. Forget all the people around you. Forget the clapping people. Forget the shouting people. Forget the disturbing people and just say oh lord here am i i come for the reign of righteousness if you're going to get to heaven get up i said if you're going to get to heaven you need this righteousness upon you you need this power of righteousness blessed are those that thirst at righteousness they shall be filled today you are going to see after that righteousness you are calling upon the lord and you're saying oh lord here i am i want the righteousness to pour down upon my soul it is time to seek the lord until he comes and he raise righteousness upon us it is time it is time
to seek the Lord until he comes and he raise righteousness upon you until you are filled until you are filled until you are filled filled with righteousness filled with righteousness blessed are those that thirst after righteousness they shall be filled how thirsty are you how thirsty are you blessed are those who thirst and hunger after righteousness for they shall be filled be filled with righteousness be filled with righteousness as the most important Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. So I just thank God, third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't 